Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey everyone, Craig Baird here. Before I begin today's story, I want to take a moment and ask that you check me out on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Canada EHX. There are several tiers with great benefits, from ad-free content to t-shirts and other cool stuff. And if you're a fan of Canadian History X, make sure you check out my other shows, From John to Justin and Canada, A Yearly Journey. And don't forget, you can also donate directly to the show at www.canadaehx.com. It helps keep this show going. All right, on with the show. Built by the White Star Line, it was the largest ship in the world at the time because it was able to carry 1,317 passengers and 823 crew from Europe to North America and back again. But on her maiden voyage across the Atlantic, she struck an iceberg and sank 600 kilometers southeast of Newfoundland. In stories, films, and documentaries, the ship is often portrayed as an American and British story, and they often fail to mention that among the passengers, there were many Canadians. In third class, there were dozens of people looking for a new life for themselves and their families. In second class, there were people returning home, while others also looked for new opportunities in a new land. In first class, there were some of the richest Canadians at the time. A sculptor, a railway president, the heir to a brewery fortune, and even the wife of a man who swindled money out of investors. Many of them made it home, while many others went down in the most famous shipwreck in history. I'm Craig Baird, this is Canadian History X, and today I'm sharing the story of the Canadians on the Titanic. Constructed by the Belfast shipbuilder Harland and Wolf, the Titanic was a truly awe-inspiring sight. Those who stood on the dock on April 10, 1912 would have been dwarfed by the 269 meter long and 53 meter high ship as they were about to board in Southampton that day. Hundreds of third class passengers boarded at 9.30 am and were the first to make the ship their home on the lower levels of the vessel. Among them was the Anderson family. Johan and his wife Elfrida were taking their children Ebba, Ellis, Ingeborg, Sigrid and Sigurd to their new home in Winnipeg. The family was originally from Sweden, and they were making their way to Canada after Alfreda's brother-in-law, Ernest Danborn, convinced her to emigrate to North America, where he had already settled. Ernest was a migrant recruiter, and convincing such a large family to migrate meant a healthy paycheck for himself. Johan Andersen was doing well in Sweden, but the temptation of something new half a world away was too much for him to pass on. Before they left, they attended a party at the house of Axel and Hilda Brogan where Malfreda told a friend that she felt off about travelling across the ocean. On April 10, 1912, the family boarded the Titanic and they were joined by Ernest Danborn and their friend Anna Nyston. Boarding the ship at the same time in the same class was Neshen Krakorian. He was a 25-year-old Armenian who was encouraged by his father to leave his country and start a better life halfway around the world. At the time, the Ottoman Empire controlled Armenia where citizens were subjected to violence and persecution which led to the Armenian Genocide only three years later. Between 1915 and 1916, 800,000 to 1.2 million Armenians were sent on death marches into the Syrian desert. Along with Neshen Krikorian, Jacob Johansson was also boarding the Titanic that day. Born in Finland, he had moved to America over a decade earlier and eventually found his way to the Klondike. Unfortunately, he arrived in 1902, well after the Klondike gold rush was over. With few prospects, he returned to Finland and bought himself a farm. But by 1912, he had sold it to his brother and was once again going to try his luck across the pond. With a plan to move to Vancouver, he bought a ticket on the ship the Adriatic, but due to the 1912 General Coal strike in England, which impacted many train and ship schedules, he was transferred to the Titanic. Once the third class passengers boarded the ship, second class passengers ventured into their cabins and Leonard Hickman was one of them. Born in England, he moved to Nipawa, Manitoba in 1908 and he did well for himself, and he was on his way back after spending Christmas with his family in England. 
During the visit, he convinced his entire family, which consisted of his parents and 10 brothers and sisters, to move to Canada with him. The family was set to leave in early April, but were delayed because of that pesky coal strike. While the majority of the family would have to wait, Leonard got tickets aboard the Titanic for himself and his two brothers, Lewis and Stanley. The rest of the family planned to follow at a later date on a different ship. As Leonard and his brothers boarded the Titanic, they would be joined in second class by Frank Mayberry from Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. In December 1911, Mayberry had left Canada with his wife and two children to winter in England. By February, he wrote to friends and Moose Jaw to say he was returning, but the family would stay in England because of his wife's poor health. Joining him in second class was Alfred Payne, who was a gifted athlete. There wasn't much he couldn't do. He was an excellent swimmer, raced yachts, and taught himself the piano and flute. His favorite song was Nearer My God to Thee, and it would become a historical irony since that's the last song allegedly played by the Titanic's band. Payne earned a medical degree from the University of Toronto in 1910, and at the age of only 21, he became Dr. Payne. Now, I don't know if he thought about changing his name to practice medicine, but I would have. Regardless, he had spent the previous six months in London learning surgical techniques, and on April 10th, 1912, he boarded the Titanic on his way back to Canada. And he couldn't have been happier. He loved new technology, and the ship was cutting edge. In fact, he specifically bought a second-class ticket so he could see the ship up close. His sister stated, It was really splendid. He was delighted. Not everyone boarding that day would be a passenger. William Ryerson had taken a job as a steward in the second-class dining room. He was born in Port Dover, Ontario in 1878, and he served in the Boer War with the Royal Canadian Dragoons. And after saying goodbye to his wife of five years, Florence, he stepped onto the Titanic to begin work, hoping to make extra money for his young family. He was also aware that, should the need arise, he would also oversee a lifeboat. Little did he know what would be in his future. Last aboard the Titanic were first-class passengers, and among them was sculptor Paul Chevier, who was traveling alone to attend the opening of the Chateau Laurier in Quebec City. His work was renowned and included the 1898 statue of Samuel de Champlain, the founder of Quebec. Charles Hayes, the president of the Grand Trunk Railway, was a fan of his work and asked him to create a bust of Sir Wilfrid Laurier to be displayed in the lobby of the Chateau Laurier. Chevier had just spent six months in Europe and was returning for the opening of the Grand Hotel, which had been designed by Bruce Price. The man who commissioned the bust of Laurier also boarded the Titanic around the same time. Charles Melville Hayes was born on May 16, 1856, and he was built for a life of iron and steel. By 1863, he was 17 and he started work as a clerk for the railroad. He was quickly promoted and reached upper management in a few years. At the age of 39, he became the head of the Grand Trunk Railway in Canada when the company was nearly bankrupt. He quickly reconstructed its organization and operations and clawed the company out of debt while supervising the construction of the Victoria Jubilee Bridge. And by 1912, when he boarded the Titanic, the company was back in black. He'd been personally invited on board by White Star Line chairman J. Bruce Ismay, who encouraged Hayes to take the doomed ship home with his family after a European vacation. And as Hayes walked up into the ship, he was joined by his wife Clara, daughter Orion, son-in-law Thornton Davidson, maid Marie Perrault, and personal secretary Vivian Payne. Following Hayes and his family onto the ship was Bess Allison, her husband Hudson, and their two children, Helen and Trevor. The couple had met on a train and married in 1907. Hudson made a fortune through smart investments and then reinvested it into various companies one of which was the British Canadian Lumber Corporation, and because of it, each year, he travelled to England with his family to attend the annual meeting. He had also taken time the past winter in England to purchase new furniture for the family's home, along with horses for their ranch. Joining the family as they stepped onto the Titanic was Mildred Brown, their cook, George Swain, their chauffeur, Sarah Daniels, their maid, and Alice Cleaver, a nursemaid. And while Hudson, Bess, Sarah, Helen, Alice, and Trevor were in first class, George and Mildred went below to second class. Alice Cleaver would be misidentified as the convicted murderer, Alice Mary Cleaver, who had killed her child years earlier. 
Various books have reprinted this mistake, as did the 1996 miniseries Titanic. But the Alice Cleaver on the Titanic was not, however, a murderer. She was hired by the Allison family in 1911 and, by all accounts, was very good with the children. While the Allisons and Hayes were rich, they were nothing compared to the Baxters. Quig Baxter and his mother Helen boarded the ship and would be staying in the second most expensive room on the Titanic. I know you're asking, how much did that cost? Well, about $100,000 in 2023 funds. The mother and son were on their way back to Montreal, where the family were William Van Horn's neighbors. He had run the Canadian Pacific Railway for years and was instrumental in its construction, and Charles Hayes, their fellow passenger, lived just down the street from them. The Baxters, however, earned their fortune through a shady Ponzi scheme that defrauded many people out of their money. Baxter's father, James, served five years in prison for it and passed away in 1905, just as he was being released. And because of it, Montreal's elite shunned Helen Baxter, and she spent winters in Europe and avoided the busy party and social scene in Montreal. Her son, who was born in the Titanic, was also a decent hockey player until a stick to the eye ended his career in 1907. After that, Quig Baxter spent his time partying and living the high life alongside his mother. He had joined his mother and sister in Europe for the winter of 1911, and while in France, he met a Belgian dancer named Bertha de Villiers at a nightclub. Ever the playboy, he told her he would marry her if she returned to Canada with him, and she agreed, so the two became engaged. However, he neglected to tell his mother. As Baxter, his mother and sister walked on to the Titanic, only he knew that joining him in first class, albeit in another room, was his secret fiancée, Bertha. Heading into first class alongside the Baxters were several other men with plenty of money in their pockets. The richest was Harry Molson. He was the great-grandson of John Molson, who founded the Molson Brewery. Described as a wild child, by 1897 he had inherited much of the Molson fortune. He loved the good life and took part in yacht racing and won the Lord Strathcona's Challenge Cup in 1901. In February 1912, he travelled to England on business where he ran into his friend Arthur Pouchen. Arthur was his opposite in pretty much every way. Where Harry was a wild child, Arthur was disciplined. He had served the Queen's own rifles, reaching the rank of Major. And during the coronation of King George V, he was a marshalling officer. He owned his own yacht, and he served as both the Vice Commodore and Rear Commodore of the Royal Canadian Yacht Club. Arthur happened to be in Europe to check on the status of the Standard Chemical Company of Canada. Originally, Harry Molson was scheduled to travel on the SS Tunisian in March, but Arthur convinced him to extend his stay so they could sail together on the Titanic. Joining Harry and Arthur was Hugo Ross, Arthur's friend from Winnipeg, along with two other friends, Thompson Beatty and Thomas McCraffy. Ross was touring the Mediterranean with Beatty and McCraffy when he caught dysentery and they had to cut their trip short. The last of the Canadian first-class passengers were the Fortune family. Mark and Mary, their son Charles and daughters Alice, Ethel and Mabel were returning home from a three-month tour of Europe. They also happened to be friends with Hugo Ross, Thomas Beatty, and Thomas McCraffy, and were delighted to see them on the ship as well. And with everyone on board, the Titanic weighed anchor for the last time at 1.30pm and departed on her westward journey across the Atlantic. For the next four days, the weather was in their favour. For the most part, it was very cold, but with no wind and calm seas, it made the crossing easier. There were various warnings of drifting ice near the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, but these were mostly ignored and the ship continued full steam ahead. During the crossing, Dr. Alfred Payne took time to sing with an impromptu choir on the ship and play the organ. He also became friends with Marion Wright, who was on her way to Oregon to marry her fiancé. Meanwhile, Neshen Kerkorian had little chance to explore the majestic Titanic since he was stuck in third class, so he kept to himself, nervous about his new life in Canada. He stayed in cramped quarters, but overall, he was comfortable. On the night of April 14th, most of the passengers went to bed, expecting another quiet day the following day. But at 11.40pm, lookout Frederick Fleet spotted an iceberg immediately in front of the ship, and everything changed. We all know what happened next. The crew attempted to avoid the iceberg, but in that effort, the ship scraped along the ice below the waterline, perforating the hull below. 
five of the 16 watertight compartments were breached and water began to flow into the ship. At Café Parisian in the first class section, Paul Chevre was playing cards with other passengers. He said, We were quietly playing auction bridge when we heard a violent noise similar to that produced by a screw racing. As he and the others looked towards the portholes, they saw an iceberg moving past them. In third class, Neshen Kerkorian and a few other men also heard a shudder and a dull thud in the bowels of the ship while playing cards. They knew something had happened, but they didn't know what. Charles Hayes was smoking a cigar in the lounge with Arthur Puchin when the Titanic hit the iceberg. Both had experience with machines of land and water, and they knew something was wrong. Bess and Hudson Allison were dining with Harry Molson in the first class dining room when they felt the ship begin to shake. Quig Baxter was told that the iceberg was nothing to worry about as he walked back to his cabin, but then he heard Bruce Ismay and Captain Smith talking, and he realized the situation was far more serious. Paul Chivray left the cafe and went to see what happened. On the deck, a crewman said the ship had hit an iceberg and some lifeboats were being prepared, but not many people were getting into them. An officer asked him if he would get into the lifeboat to set an example to the others. He agreed, and after he did, six others followed him. And while he was one of the first to get into the lifeboat, the Fortune family didn't seem to be too worried, and they stayed within their cabin. William Hayes was told the ship was fine and it was nothing to worry about. But he decided to be on the safe side, and he went to gather his wife, daughter, and maid, and directed them to lifeboat number three. His wife did not want to leave him, but he assured her that the ship would stay afloat for ten hours. The lifeboat was simply a precaution. The lifeboat descended in fits and starts at 12.55 a.m., with 32 people and one Pekingese dog named Sun Yat-sen before it safely reached the water. Harry Molson didn't seem to be too concerned about the iceberg. He'd already survived the sinking of the Scotsman in 1898 and the sinking of the Canada in 1904. Molson's friend, Arthur Bouchen, was looking for his friends when he came across Hugo Ross standing at the Grand Staircase. He told him the ship had hit an iceberg and they needed to get off the ship. Ross told him, It will take more than an iceberg to get me off this ship. In the quarters of the Allison family, Alice Cleaver grabbed Trevor Allison and went to a lifeboat without telling Bess or Hudson. She left the ship on lifeboat 11 at 1.35 a.m., which was filled with 50 people. As a lifeboat reached the water, it was nearly swamped by a jet of water being pumped out of the ship to stem the flooding. Quig Baxter grabbed his mother and sister, bundled them up, and took them to lifeboat 6. After they were in the lifeboat, he ran back to get Bertha. Bertha did not want to leave without Baxter, but a very famous woman in the boat convinced her to stay. Her name? Molly Brown. Known as the unsinkable Molly Brown, an American socialite and philanthropist, she made her fortune in mining. She helped in the evacuation before she evacuated and she became a legendary figure in the Titanic story. After Brown convinced her fiancé to stay in the lifeboat, Quig Baxter quickly introduced his mother and sister to her, then gave his mother a flask of brandy to keep them warm. Quig Baxter watched his mother, sister and fiancé be lowered into the water. The lifeboat only had 24 people and a Pomeranian dog on board, despite the fact it could hold 65. In the lifeboat were crew members Robert Hitchens and Frederick Fleet. Several people on the boat pleaded for another crew member. Titanic second officer Charles Lightoller asked if anyone had experience. Arthur Puchin was nearby and said he had experience with yachts. Lightoller told him to get into the lifeboat and he shimmied down the ropes into the lifeboat as a third, unofficial crew member. Meanwhile, Bess Allison was frantically looking for her son Trevor, but had no idea he was already off the boat. Bess and her daughter Helen were able to get into lifeboat 6, but she refused to leave without Hudson or Trevor. She was told by someone that Hudson was on the other side of the ship. She grabbed her daughter, got out of the lifeboat, and ran to find him. Arthur Pushin said, Mrs. Allison could have gotten away in perfect safety, but somebody told her Mr. Allison was in a boat being lowered on the opposite side of the deck, and with her daughter she rushed away from the boat. Apparently she reached the other side to find that Mr. Allison was not there. Meanwhile, our boat had put off. The Fortune family finally left their first-class cabin when Charlie Fortune knocked on the door and said he had been on deck and saw the growing panic. The stewards told them there was nothing to worry about, but Charles wasn't about to listen to them. Dr. Alfred Payne hurried to the deck and struggled to make his way through the scared crowd trying to find lifeboats. He was able to reach his friend Marion Wright and he told her, 
I've been trying to find you for some time. He hurried her over to lifeboat 9 and waved goodbye as the lifeboat was lowered down the side of the ship. It was the last time she saw him alive. The Anderson family from Sweden were able to get to the top deck in the chaos. Lifeboat 13 was available, but only Anna Nyston, the Anderson's family friend, got into the boat. The rest of the family, for a reason lost to history, never joined her. Lifeboat 13 was lowered at 1.40 a.m. with 55 people on board. Once it hit the water, it was nearly swamped by a huge stream of water coming out of the condenser exhaust. Over at the Grand Staircase, the Fortune family reached the deck but were told that only women and children were allowed to go further. Mary Alice, Ethel, and Mabel Fortune were ushered on the deck without time to say goodbye. The women left on lifeboat 10 at 1.50 a.m., only a half hour before the ship disappeared beneath the icy waters. The lifeboat had 57 people on board, including Elizabeth Dean, the youngest and last surviving passenger of the ship. Beside her was Neshin Krikorian, who had fought through the crowds in third class to get into the top deck, and how he managed to escape is debated. Some say he had hid in the empty boat before it was lowered. Another report states he jumped into the boat as it was being lowered. Either way, he safely got off the sinking ship. The same cannot be said for Leonard, Lewis, and Stanley Hickman. None were able to find a lifeboat. Frank Merberry, who left his wife and two children back in England, never got to Moose Jaw. He was one of the 90% of men in second class who went down with the ship. Eight months after he died, his daughter Nancy was born. William Ryerson, the steward in second class, was put in charge of Lifeboat 9, the same one that carried Marion Wright, Dr. Alfred Payne's friend. Thomas Beatty fell into the ocean but was able to swim towards the collapsible lifeboat. Unfortunately, his time in the water sealed his fate and he died from hypothermia before the lifeboat was rescued from the icy waters. Molson was last seen taking his shoes off, ready to jump into the ocean. Out at sea, Paul Chevet sat in his lifeboat and watched the great ship sink into the Atlantic Ocean. He said, The Titanic sank without noise, and the suction was very feeble. In the final spasm, the stern of the Leviathan stood in the air, and then the vessel finally disappeared. Neshin Krikorian was with a crew member, and they had to row fast to escape the undertow. Hours later, the crew member died from exposure to the cold, leaving only Krikorian to pilot the lifeboat along with the women and children. He rowed throughout the night. At daybreak, the Carpathia saw the lifeboat and rescued them. Alex Cleaver and Trevor Allison were rescued from lifeboat 11 by 7 a.m. In lifeboat 3, where Clara and Orion Hayes were, the survivors drifted for hours waiting to be rescued and argued over minor annoyances. They were finally rescued at 7.30 a.m. Through the night, the survivors in lifeboat 6 mostly argued. Robert Hitchens resented that Arthur Prishin was in the boat with him because he was a major and he thought he would try to pull rank. Arthur and Molly Brown both argued with Hitchens to rescue people struggling in the water, but Hitchens refused and ordered people to stop rowing altogether. At one point, Brown asked if the women could row to keep warm. Hitchens said no, so Brown ignored him. When he physically tried to stop her, she threatened to throw him overboard and Arthur backed her up. The boat was one of the last to be rescued at 8 a.m. Soon after, Lifeboat 10 was rescued, which included the women of the Fortune family. The body of Charles Hayes was rescued from the North Atlantic on April 26th, the same day his new hotel, the Chateau Laurier, was to open. The bodies of his son-in-law, Thornton Davis, nor his secretary, Vivian, were ever found. Hayes was brought back to Montreal aboard his private rail car and his funeral was one of the largest in the city's history to that point. The bodies of Harry Molson and Hugo Ross were never found. A month after the disaster, the body of Thompson Beattie was pulled from the water. Bess and Hudson Allison had both died. Their daughter was the only child from first or second class to die on the Titanic. Quig Baxter's body was never found. His fiancée Bertha stayed with his mother Helen for several months before she left Canada and returned to Paris. Among Leonard, Lewis, and Stanley Hickman, only Lewis's body was found. The entire Anderson family never made it to Winnipeg and their bodies were never found. The bodies of Ernest Danborn and Jacob Johansson were recovered by the McKay Bennett. Neshin Krikorian spent three weeks in hospital recovering from pneumonia after he was rescued from the lifeboat. He eventually settled in St. Catharines in 1918 where he and his wife Persa raised a son and two daughters. He never went into a boat again. In 1953, he attended the premiere of the movie Titanic. After watching the movie, he said, I tried to forget for 41 years and now it's all back in my mind again. 
He spoke little of his experience, but his grandson stated he sometimes heard him talk of the screams he heard from the passengers on the water. The sound haunted him until he died at the age of 89. Paul Chevrolet remained in Canada for six months before he returned to France. On his voyage back to Europe, he rarely came out of his cabin and kept to himself. He never traveled by sea again and died suddenly on February 20th, 1914. Alice Cleaver, the nursemaid for the Allisons, never spoke about her experience on the Titanic. She died on November 1st, 1984 at the age of 95. Trevor, the baby she took with her when she escaped, was raised by his great uncle George and great aunt Lillian. In 1929, while visiting with his grandparents, he ate a spoiled beef tongue sandwich and died a week later on August 7th, 1929. William Ryerson went on to serve in the First World War, reaching the rank of sergeant. He returned to Canada in 1920 and worked at a Hamilton tire plant. He eventually made his way back to England in 1937 and died there in 1949. That's almost the end of the story of the Canadians on the Titanic. But before I go, I want to share a little bit more about Arthur Pouchin. Arthur Pouchin never minced words when he spoke about the conduct of Captain Smith and Bruce Ismay. He said, The loss of the Titanic was due to the criminal carelessness at running at full speed through ice with a new crew. He was the only Canadian called to testify to the US Senate on April 23, 1912. At first, though, he was called a hero, but newspapers criticized him for not pulling rank to rescue more people out of the water. After all, he was a military officer and could have done so. Before long, it was claimed he was dressing as a woman so he could get into a lifeboat. This was not true. It didn't matter. He was soon snubbed by Toronto High Society. And as the 1920s went on, he lost much of his fortune before the 1929 stock market crash put a nail in his financial coffin. He died only two months after the stock market crash on December 7th, 1929. But that is not the end of the story. In 1987, a submersible at the wreck site picked up a wallet and brought it to the surface. It was Arthur's wallet. It seems that as he climbed down the rope to get into the lifeboat, his wallet fell out of his pocket, floated on the surface for a while before it eventually joined the Titanic at the bottom of the Atlantic. Inside the wallet was his calling card, traveler's checks, and streetcar tickets. I hope you enjoyed that episode and our look at the Titanic. Next week, we're looking at Trudeau Mania. This show is researched, produced, and written by me, Craig Baird, with the help of Dila Velasquez. Audio production and design by Rosalind Kufor. If this is your first time listening and you like what you heard, please take a moment and give us a five-star review to help other people find these amazing stories. And there are so many for you to sink your teeth into. If you enjoy this podcast, then please check out my other podcasts, From John to Justin, Canada, A Yearly Journey, Pucks and Cups, and Canada's Great War. We love hearing from you, so if you have a show topic you want me to cover, email me at craig at canadaehx.com or stop by my website and social media. I'll include all of those in my show notes. Until next time, I'm Craig Baird, and this is Canadian History X.